One Israel Fund, beating to the rhythm of the heartland, enhancing and securing daily life in the Jewish communities of Judea and Samaria for over 25 years. Join us and make a difference. Hi, everybody. My name is Eve Harrow, Israeli tour guide, podcaster, public speaker, and director of tourism and community development for When Israel Fund. When Israel Fund is the sponsor of tonight's webinar, and I thank you all, all for joining us. And by all, I mean well over a thousand people. So this is definitely a topic that people want to hear about. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with When Israel Fund, we have for since the early 90s been the premier organization doing what we can to support the communities in Judea and Samaria. A lot of other organizations don't do so for a variety of reasons. And so it is imperative that we get in there, we build playgrounds, we're building a medical center in Binyamin, a lot of security, and anything that we can do to enhance the safety and just the daily life for the over 500,000 Jews living in Judea and Samaria. We're looking forward to all of you coming back very soon. Um, I run bus tours for One Israel Fund during the year, of course, not this last year. And we would very much enjoy seeing you on one of our tours, taking you to places that you have probably never been and meeting people that you can't even believe exist. Just amazing people uh, keeping our biblical heartland Jewish. For the last year, we have been running a series of these webinars, and you're welcome to go on the One Israel Fund site and catch up on them if you weren't with us. Naftali Bennett, Carolyn Glick, Gil Hoffman, Dr. Avi Bell, Mark Zell, a, really a host of people on topics that are important to many of us. And we've also been running virtual tours about once a month. I go into one of the communities, talk to the people there, the businesses they have, the family life, something affiliated with the Tanakh in the area that they're living. Those are also on our site. If you're interested in sponsoring a webinar or virtual tour, as you can see, when Israel Fund does this as a public service, we did not charge, we do not, do not charge for our webinars, but we do have overhead. And if you want us to continue with the programming that has really gotten kudos and the very people very much appreciate, then you can be in touch with me, Eve at oneisraelfund.org, or go on the website or call the office and you can find us and join the family of One Israel Fund. We have an incredible group of donors who have helped us raise millions over the years in order to really do what we are there to do, which is keep, keep Judea and Samaria out of the news and just make sure that the daily life flows the way we want it to. And that when you come and join us here and visit, you can see that for yourselves. And we hope that that is very soon. And to that end, I invited Rabbi Dov Lippmann to join us tonight. Um, Rabbi Lippmann is a public servant in the true sense of the word. He was a Haver Knesset, he was a member of the Israeli parliament for a couple of years, but that was just the beginning. And he has spent many, many years on many different topics, helping people, especially Americans, um, connect with the very many people that he knows here, using his connections in order to facilitate the needs of those of us who are maybe English speakers, don't know their way around, want to come and visit. And of course, in the last few months, the main topic has been, how do people get here? Israel has been closed down, maybe not, what's going on, quarantine, all kinds of things. So Rabbi Dov Lippmann, thank you so much for joining me. And for the, I would just want to say, for the for the many hours that you have put in specifically for this webinar, I also want to, to thank Scott Feltman from our office in New York. Um, we got hundreds, if not thousands of questions. Um, you will not be hearing the specific answer to your question. Like if your name is Aviva, I'm just making this up, and you wrote to me because your daughter Panina needs you to come here and visit, and you had COVID, you can smell garlic now, but coffee is still a little off. You're not going to hear that exact question. We got some great letters. You're not going to hear that exact question, but things have been collated and organized. So what I suggest before we start is that you get a pen and paper, because it could be that your question is going to be answered in four different questions, all right? And so pay attention. And also, we need to give a disclaimer that the information that we give you tonight is true up until this minute, which is 8.05 p.m. Israel time. Things are changing all the time. The situation is incredibly fluid. So if you're hearing this webinar in two weeks, don't count on the fact that what we said tonight still holds. You still have to be in touch with your consulate. You still have to understand like what the new rules are, but we're trying to give some clarity to a very complicated situation, at least of tonight. And so with that, I would like to introduce 
um, with great honor, Dr. Uh, Rabbi, not a doctor yet, maybe soon, Rabbi Dov Lippman, whom I've known for many years. I think we actually first met on a baseball field, but that's another story for another time. So thank you so much for joining us here on the One Is All Fun webinar this evening. Thank you, Eve. It's so great to be with you. Thank you to everyone who's tuning in. And a real thank you to One Israel Fund for having taken the initiative uh, to provide this service. All right, so we're going to start. I'm actually going to start with the newest question that just came up today, because Israel just came out with some rules that there are countries now that are having a really difficult wave of COVID, uh, India, etc. And um, there are some new rules that are being applied now. Maybe Israelis won't be able to fly to those countries. Maybe people coming in from those specific countries are going to have to do um, more diligent quarantine. Can you bring us up to date on really what the news that just broke a few hours ago? So first of all, as I'm going to tell you throughout tonight, and I'm going to reinforce what you said, Eve, about the dynamic situation, uh, I will post everything uh, on my Facebook page or my Facebook Thanks. profile as news becomes solidified. Because what happens very often is reporters get wind of something and then they start putting things out there without real clarity. And what people really want here is clarity. So yes. on this particular question, you are correct that there is a new directive that relates to countries. They're basically gonna have rules for level one and rules for level two. Rules for level one, which are all around the world, remain the same. Everything we'll talk about tonight. Level two, where there are countries where there are specific fears about variants and outbreaks and, and lack of proper uh, vaccination procedures. Those are the places where they're actually gonna put uh, a hold on Israelis traveling to those countries and to anyone from those countries, even people who are vaccinated uh, coming to Israel, there might be rules in terms of requiring quarantine and letting people come in. There's also a question mark about what are people who already are there and are stuck right. there. I already have three messages from people who are there panicked that they won't be allowed in. And that's why I said, I, I need clarity on that before I can answer it fully. So anyone who is concerned about that issue, uh, I will be posting it uh, within the next day or so, once I have full clarity about what we're talking about. And I wanna even mention, even when I do list those countries, the health ministry has made it clear that in an instant, they might put new countries into that category. So everyone has to constantly uh, be checking the updates and, and to see. So it's a complicated issue right now. Oh, yeah. uh, and I'm not walking, giving you any clarity in terms of what the rules are, but by tomorrow, uh, I will post them in with as great clarity as I have. Okay. Look, I think it's important for us as Israelis also to make clear to most of our listeners who are not here that Israel is not being obstinate just because it has nothing better to do. I'm a tour guide, the entire tourism sector. We're waiting for people to come. We miss everybody. We want to show you the country. But nobody made bat soup here and the Israelis got sick. Okay, the, the COVID came into Israel via the airport and we have now come out of it to a great degree. It's, it's really open. Nobody wants to go back into it. And so we're dealing with a situation where the government is trying to find that golden road where Israel Israelis won't get sick, people won't bring in the variants, and we won't have to go into lockdowns again, but where we can also allow not just tourists, but mainly family unification. I think the majority of the people who wrote into us have a pregnant daughter here, elderly parents, whatever it is, and really, really bar mitzvah coming up, like really, you know, big, big issues. Okay, so <clears throat> to start with the first question. So what are the current rules for vaccinated non-Israelis or non-Israelis who want to enter Israel? Okay, hmm. so uh, vaccinated non-Israelis, or I'm assuming the question is, or non-Israelis who have uh, had corona and uh, yes. have recovered, uh, what are the rules uh, for them? So again, everyone who's listening, if you're taking notes, this is for those who have been vaccinated and those or those who had corona and have recovered. So in that situation, the rule is very, very specific. You are allowed to come into Israel for uh, to visit a first degree relative. First degree relative meaning a parent, a sibling, or a child. Those okay. people, though, are people who are Israeli citizens or permanent residents. So just clarifying again. You, as someone who's vaccinated or recovered from corona, are allowed to come into Israel to visit a first degree relative who is a citizen or a permanent resident of Israel. That's the basic, basic formula. Now, there's a lot that you have to do uh, in order to get that. Maybe you'll ask that question. That's the basic Right. So what formula. documents, what documents for starters do they need to bring in? Let's start with that. 
So first of all, uh, you will present this essentially uh, to the, the closest uh, a consulate to wherever you live, or the first degree relative can actually do this in Israel. We'll talk about it mm -hmm. as the night goes on, how to do that. But let's talk about the documents because that's what people really want to know what they have to prepare. First of all, you have to have photocopy of a passport or ID number of the first degree relative residing in Israel. So you're proving that you have that first degree relative in Israel with their passport or their- Their Israeli, pa their Israeli passport. Correct, correct, okay. their Israeli passport. Then you need the photocopy of the passports of any of the applicants, whoever is asking to go in to visit the first degree relative. Mm -hmm. Next and most important, you have to have the proof of the family connection. So in a situation where it's, let's say, someone visiting a child, that will be the birth certificate. Mm -hmm. If it's a situation where someone's visiting a sibling, that's going to be two birth certificates because you have to show that both of you right. are the children of the parent. So whatever is necessary to prove that you are a first degree relative, an important change which has caused a lot of panic for people is that that document does not need an apostille in this situation. So it's just a photocopy. It's proof Great. of that document. That is what you need. That um, rule just every, came off a couple of days ago, as I understand. That is correct. Yeah, that, that, that was, we were fighting for quite some time. Uh, many different people were fighting against that because it was causing significant delays and financial burdens mm -hmm. and even impossibilities for some people. So the proof of relationship is number three. Next, okay. every single applicant has to fill out what's called an isolation affidavit. Because even if you're vaccinated, and we'll get to that later, there is a still a process of isolation, of quarantine. So you have to fill out that affidavit. That form is available on government websites. I will be posting it again on my Great. Facebook page so that people can have access to it. That's the link. You have to fill that out. It's your isolation affidavit. Very important. Proof of health insurance for Israel mm. that says outright that it includes COVID. This is very important. You yeah. can't just go to your regular insurance company and say, oh, I have traveler's insurance, proof of COVID. Uh, people have been asking what companies you can find them. There's one mm -hmm. that's called Trawick International that I know has it. Uh, I'm not okay. getting paid for them to say that. <laughs> I love to say that. It's just the one that this was unsolicited, mind. right. That's right. It comes, it comes to my mind right now is one that I know many people have used. You must have your valid plane ticket, your itinerary for travel. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize this. The first step is actually purchasing the ticket. You have to show that you have that ticket. And then finally, your certificate of recovery or your vaccination certificate for anybody who wants to enter Israel. Those are the things uh, that you need. Now, once you do have that first degree relative, you are allowed to travel with a spouse. So then you'd have to prove again, that relationship with your spouse. Mm -hmm. And then you also can travel with your own children. Now, here's the one caveat. Remember, anybody who's traveling here is someone who had uh, a right. vaccination or corona and recovered and a medical document saying that they recovered from corona. So that essentially eliminates children who are in the category of not being vaccinated. They're not able to get vaccinations. But I do want to emphasize, you are allowed to travel with a child who is under the age of four. This is something which we just got clarity about over the course of today. Even if they didn't have COVID. That's right. Okay. If they did not have COVID. They have not been vaccinated. Children okay. under the age of four. But when we get to the talk about quarantine, you'll understand that they actually have to do significant quarantine. So we'll get to that. Right now, we're just talking okay. about what do you need to have in terms of your documentation. So I just want to, we're talking about a very clear category, vaccinated or recovered from Corona with medical documentation. You can travel mm -hmm. to see a first degree relative and you can bring your spouse and you can bring any children over the age of four, only if they've been vaccinated and or recovered from Corona under the okay. age of four, even if not. Now, medical documentation is a letter from your personal physician enough. Israel has now what we call the green passports. I flew last month, it's something that we used. Not every country has that. And are there countries that have it, but Israel isn't accepting it because it's not on a level that seems trustworthy? So what exactly, when you say medical documentation, what exactly do you mean? It seems to be pretty loose. Uh, a letter from a doctor saying that you had corona and recovered okay. is being accepted for that. Uh, remember, there's going to be a process which we'll get to about testing when you get to Israel. Mm -hmm. So that's enough as, as of now. So it's 
the, the documentation of, of, of vaccination or medical documentation of having recovered from Corona. Okay. So let's get into the quarant the issue of quarantine. Cause that that's, I know, making a lot of people very nervous. Um, if somebody was vaccinated, why, why do they have to go into quarantine? Or if they were so, sick? Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that Israel discovered very quickly is that whereas Israel provides people with digital proof of vaccination, mm -hmm. it's all computerized, it's all through our uh, health uh, organizations and right. other countries, people are literally just getting a slip of paper, which unfortunately we live in a world where people forge those as well. And therefore, on the one hand, Israel is saying that we will accept vax all vaccinations from countries around the world. That's on the one hand, and people are asking that question as well. Uh, so with Johnson Johnson as well, the Moderna, the Pfizer, et cetera. Right, oh, that's an important point, okay. Yes, so those four for sure are accepted. Uh, but when you come to Israel, let me just say this part, before anybody travels to Israel, anybody, under any categories that we'll talk about tonight, because we are gonna get to exceptions for people who are unvaccinated later on, Anybody who travels to Israel must, first of all, take a COVID test, a test, a PCR test within 72 hours of their flight to Israel. They're going to be tested at the airport in Israel for COVID as well. And then in this situation, you will go into quarantine uh, based on where you said you're going into quarantine. But there's something called a serological test, which you can test, take, which shows that you had the vaccination or recovered from corona. Mm -hmm. And that process, uh, there's a list of labs that are accepted by Israel for you to do that. They're throughout Israel, relatively easily accessible. And you go take that test. You could do it on the way home from the airport. You can do it after you've rested a little bit in quarantine. And then once you get the results back from your serological test, there's then a link. And again, I'll post all of these links on my Facebook page for everyone who's watching. It's there from a few weeks ago, but I'll do it again. You then have to upload it to the health, of minist health ministry site. And then you'll get an official statement of approval from the health ministry that you can leave quarantine. For people who are trying to plan, that's generally a two to four day process. So just to understand, okay. that, there are some people, by the way, who have told me they went straight from the airport to a hospital called Asaf Horoe, which is about 15 minutes from the airport. They got the results six hours later and right. they began the process. So it can be less, but plan for yourself two to four days for that process to play out. So we're talking about vaccinated people, people who have recovered from Corona, they still have to go into quarantine and they still have to then uh, get out of the quarantine through the serological test and the health ministry. Now, I mentioned before, you could travel with children under the age of four. Those children do not have that process. So if you're bringing a child under the age of four with you, they have to go into quarantine for two oh. weeks but they do have the option of getting out of quarantine. If they do two negative PCR tests during their quarantine time, they can get out in 10 days. So please remember, even though I mentioned that if you're valid to come into Israel, you can come as well with an approval for your child under four, but they still have to go through the pretty much the full quarantine process because mm -hmm. they have no ability to have the serological test to get them out of quarantine. Mm -hmm. But people go into quarantine, but they're allowed to leave quarantine to go to the hospital or go to the lab in order to get the testing done, right? You can't order it to your hotel room. That is okay. correct. By the way, there are apparently numerous private companies uh, that help mm -hmm. with this. Uh, some even come to the home. They're expensive. People can look that up. They can go on Google and find them. And I'm not getting into okay. all of that. I do also know that United Hatsala also provides this service and that is accepted. So you can also definitely explore that. All right. And all of these forms are in English. Yes. All these government forms that you've been mentioning, the they're in English. Gonna, yeah. The forms that we'll be loading up are forms that mm -hmm. you can get in English as well. Yes. Okay. All right. Because that I, I got some questions about that, but I don't speak Hebrew. So before you come to Israel, you have to learn Hebrew and then you have to get a PCR test. And <laughs> we'll just add to the whole thing. Okay. Um, what do we have here? How they come to Israel. Can they be picked up? by a family member? Do they have to take a cab? Like, and, and are, where are they go? Are, are they going, can they go to family or do they have to go to a Corona hotel? Like what happens after they land and they do that testing in the airport and then they're out of the airport? And who's monitoring, yeah. by the way, who's monitoring this? So absolutely, so first where of they're all- Where they're going. Uh, sure, they are looking into the option at some point of actually having the serological testing possibly at the airport. And that's not something which is happening at the moment. You are allowed to travel, uh, whether it's uh, with a private car, with a cab, or you can even rent your own car. 
at the airport, that's all allowed. You are not allowed to take any other public transportation to the place that you're going to. So again, okay. private car, someone picking you up, a cab. And, and by the way, if someone's picking you up, the ideal is for you to be in the back seat, uh, people and wearing masks, uh, certainly to right. keep those uh, precautions in place. There are not Corona hotels. A lot of people get asked, why are they forcing me to a hotel? Why are they forcing me to have an electronic bracelet? That's not the situation uh, today. You basically mm -hmm. tell them where you're quarantined. You can go, by the way, to a, a, a vacant apartment. You can go to a place where you have your own room and your own bathroom facilities. You can go to an Airbnb. You are not allowed to go to a hotel. You are not allowed to go to a place where anybody, where they're hosting other guests in any kind of a public manner. That's what you're not allowed to do. Uh, can you go to your family? If you're coming in to visit your daughter, can you go to her? You, assuming that you have uh, facilities that qualify for quarantine, which okay. means your own place, your own bathroom, and those are the health ministry reg regulations regarding quarantine. Okay, and is someone following up on this? Like maybe there's someone listening who's saying, well, this sounds great, I'll land, I'll take a cab to wherever, and no one will know any better that I'm not in quarantine and I'm not doing whatever it is that Rabbi Littman just said we had to do. How is there? How is this being followed up? So first of all, there is police uh, enforcement and they could show up at your house and check to see or wherever the address is to see, are you in quarantine? There are very steep fines and, and consequences uh, for not. I have to say, the fact that people didn't keep to the rules is one of the reasons why we have all these strict it, regulations. Exactly so, why I brought it up, right. Yes, so I really would hope uh, that everyone who's listening will follow the rules. Israel is doing its best to try to balance a very, very difficult situation. And I mm -hmm. certainly stand here. Uh, I'm not an official government representative. I'm here on my own sharing with you what the government rules are. But I definitely encourage and implore everyone uh, to very much keep to uh, the rules. I have to mention also, once we're on the topic of quarantine, and people should really make note of these two points. Number one, you cannot in advance schedule a trip to Israel that's gonna be for less than two weeks. You cannot okay. do that in advance. And the reason for that is very straightforward because Israel says you, you might be in a situation where you have to be quarantined for two weeks. You know, we're trusting <laughs> your vaccination document, but we live in a world where sadly they have been forged, there have been issues. So mm -hmm. we need to know that from in advance, you at least have the capability of being here for more than two weeks now. If you get out of quarantine legally through the health ministry, et cetera, and you then want to change the flight to make it shorter, of course, you have the right to do that. But that's why okay. they ask that the flight plans have to be for two weeks. I want to say something else as well. And that is you cannot begin. I mentioned before, you cannot begin the process until you have a ticket. They also will not issue an approval uh, more than two weeks before your trip. A lot of people ask why. Why do I have to wait till two weeks before? That seems to be cutting it close. And the issue is because, like we said before, everything is dynamic. What happens right. if, God forbid, all of a sudden there's some crazy outbreak uh, in Israel uh, of a variant? God forbid, and they have to change all the rules. So that's why they want to have that two-week uh, approval time to know we're giving you an approval for two weeks, but not for a month, not for three months, because we don't know what's going to happen in a month or two months. So again, you ask for the approval. Uh, two weeks before your flight and you also have to have a stay in israel that's for at least two weeks in time people have asked there is no maximum you know whatever fits into your visa your tourist visa whatever it is that okay. is fine but a minimum of two weeks okay if you're already speaking of visas you mentioned that you're allowed to come and visit people who are permanent residents or israeli citizens what if you what if someone's here on a student visa Hearing from a lot of people who, whose kids are here studying for the year, they're thinking about going to Naomi, whatever it is, but they're not, they haven't made Aliyah yet, and they want to come and visit them. How, where does that fall into the play here? So at the moment, uh, anybody other than a resident or a permanent resident or a citizen, it's as if they're not in Israel in any kind of a valid okay. manner. Of course they are, but for these purposes, uh, that is not considered at all. I will say... Everyone should just keep their eyes on my posts and updates because I think even possibly as early as Sunday, we might have some news. And I'm just saying this just for people to be prepared regarding people in Israel with student visas who are going through births. There might be on the verge of a uh, situation in terms of that. So check back uh, to see about that. But otherwise, all other visas are off the table at the moment. We are hoping okay. to see uh, progress made in terms of that. I will also mention, since we've been on the topic of people who are vaccinated, 
uh, this is very important, and this is again announced today by the tourism ministry. The goal, and I emphasize the word goal, but this at least gives, gives people light at the end of the tunnel, is that in July, we will reach a point where individual tourists who are vaccinated will be mm -hmm. able to enter Israel without the need for showing a first degree relative or the like. This is not an official policy yet, but it is from the government. That's why I feel comfortable saying it. We've been working okay. on it for some time. There's gonna be a gradual process about tour groups and things that can be monitored well, assuming that all goes well and we're protected from the variants, et cetera. The goal is that by July, and again, so if you're planning, you know, a vacation, right. whatever it is, July could be a time where even someone who does not have that first degree relative can begin the process of thinking about coming into Israel just as a regular tourist who is vaccinated. Again, there will be quarantine rules, there will be a process, but that is a time when that hopefully will actually open up. Okay, so I've been following also, obviously I'm a tour guide on all these lists and that's something we are very interested in seeing have happened. And also, I just want to mention that when Israel Fund is kicking around the idea of perhaps organizing a mission, a group of people coming here, and then when Israel Fund would take care of a lot of this kind of paperwork, because it seems that the groups might have an easier time coming in at some point than, um, than individuals. So that's something, if there's, if there's a demand for that, and that's up to you people who are listening here tonight, that's something we will definitely seriously consider. And then once you're here, and then you could stay and visit your relatives or whatever. So... We're, we're trying all the time to get you here. We really, really are, but get you here in a safe way. Um, the vaccines, it has to be two. You mentioned the four big ones. Great. Has to great be two question. vaccines. It to, yes, it has to be the full dose of the vaccine. So two doses, absolutely. A lot of people have asked about that. Uh, again, they're allowing all the vaccinations that I mentioned, but still two doses, absolutely. Well, though, is Johnson & Johnson one dose? To, from the get-go? Isn't one of them just one dose? I, I believe that it might be. Again, I, wanna, okay. I, I believe that it is. Whatever but whatever is the, of, of, of that, that particular vaccine. Okay. Correct. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, okay. You mentioned that people can apply through their consulate or through the immigration authority offices um, in Israel. So like, how do they decide what to do? And I just want to add a personal thing. I went yesterday because I lost my Israeli passport in the airport when I came back last month from what was a crazy trip. Um, and I went into the, I had an appointment and I went in to, to renew my passport. And there were people who had been waiting since six o'clock in the morning outside in order to try and get paperwork done for their family members outside of Israel to help them get in. Like there's a push and there's a pull going on here. And a lot of people have, within Israel, um, can, can work work for you to try and get you in here. So can you explain a little bit about that? Because I'm sure there are people listening who are either in Israel right now or are going to call up their daughter-in-law who's thrilled that they're coming anyway, just joking, um, to say like, you know, help us get there. Absolutely. How does that so work? The official policy is that you go through the consulate, your closest consulate, you send them an email. By the way, all of these documents, if you're sending it to the consulate, have to be in one PDF file one PDF file uh, to make sure that you, they, they, they open it, they can see it in that manner. Important point. All the documentation uh, is put. Uh, and you might be very anxious when you do that because you send it to the consulate, the consulates are being inundated. They're being flooded. There's no other way to word to use. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of applications <laughs> and not a very large staff to monitor that. So therefore there is another option which you might want to explore. And that is the first degree relative who you're coming to see in Israel is allowed to go to their nearest immigration authority mm -hmm. office to ask for the approval. Now, this gets tricky because all the different branches function differently and then the heads of the branches function differently. So for example, there are certain branches where you get there and you go without an appointment and uh, you can walk away with the approval on the spot. There are right. other ones which your information and they'll say we'll get it to you there are some which like you said before are so mobbed with people that again there's one in Yerushalayim that opens at eight o'clock and people are lined up by 6 30 by yeah. 6 15 by 6 a.m because they're yeah. only allowed 30 <clears throat> people in so every single place is different and you have to go and see exactly what their policies are it's not simple and it takes time and it takes effort and it might require going back a second time but right. I am telling people that in, you know, if it's getting close to the flight date 
and you have not heard back from the consulate, this is absolutely something that you should consider. And by the way, I'll mention this now, I'll mention it a few times uh, during the, uh, the broadcast. You can absolutely uh, reach out to me via email, via uh, Facebook, if you have any questions at all uh, to help guide you through that. I will also mention that I have a, a, someone who's assisting me on the United States side. I'll just mention it. Uh, the Gmail address is ashmaureen at gmail.com. Ashmaureen at gmail.com. Maureen Ash. You can ask her questions as well. Uh, but we're here to try to just help and guide you. So you might go to the consulate and hear nothing. You're starting to panic. You can definitely let us know. You can also ask your first degree relative to go to the immigration office. Again, they have to have all the documentation with them. Right. And go and the presentation themselves to ask for this reunification of sorts with the first degree relative. Okay, got that. Um, it's not John Kerry who's helping you from the other side, I assume, right? No, it's just... Yeah. <laughs> I'm That's not going to that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, grandparents, not a first degree relative, but want to come see their grandchildren. There's a bar mitzvah, there's a wedding, something. Where do they fall into the here? This is uh, without a doubt one of the most painful uh, parts of this process so far. Uh, you know, having been blessed to, to make weddings and knowing that, that grandparents need to be there now. Again, if the parents of the bride or groom are in Israel, then the grandparents can come in as a request as a first degree relative. And I want to ah. emphasize this. People who are coming okay. in as, as first degree relatives, don't mention the wedding, don't mention the bar mitzvah, don't mention the brit, because that gets them all confused when you start talking about that. You're coming to see a first degree relative. So if the parents of the, of the bride and groom are living in Israel, you have that option. Again, we're talking about people who are vaccinated. If mm -hmm. we have new olim, though, thank God, Israel's filled with this wonderful young people who have made Aliyah and, and they've come here and they've met the person they're going to marry. That's where it becomes painful because the grandparents in that situation, if there's no first degree relative in Israel, oh. at, the, at the moment, there is no mechanism for them to come. I can tell you that behind the scenes, we are working very hard with the relevant ministers to try to get that changed, to allow mm -hmm. for grandparents and they don't have a first degree relative to be at the wedding. We also are working on, again, these are things that we're working on. I just want people to know that there are people working behind the scenes. That's not a promise that it will happen, but what about, un what about unvaccinated? Uh, I'm ask you. Uh, right, right. Uh, that are getting married. So these are all things that we are absolutely working on, but at the moment, at the moment, it, the rules are very clear. It's specifically what we've just said. For the weddings, it's first degree relatives specifically, and it's not for weddings, it's in general. When we mm -hmm. talk about unvaccinated, there will be some exceptions that we'll get to. But right now in the category of people who are vaccinated, uh, unfortunately, grandparents cannot come to the grandchild's uh, wedding if there isn't a first degree relative to serve as the mechanism, as the vehicle at this point in time. Right, okay. And I would imagine that also counts for lone soldiers who are having, I know people who are doing that, who've managed to come in here because their son is having his, getting his beret or whatever it is, and they want to be here for that. And it's also that process. Okay. Now, once a fully vaccinated visitor to Israel is cleared from quarantine, can they go anywhere they want? They have a green pass. They can go to restaurants. They can go wherever Israelis can go. There's a lot, there's a lot of misinformation about this out there. At the moment, all this process allows you to do <laughs> is allows you to leave quarantine, uh, but it does not give you the green passport for access to all of Israel. The health no. ministry is working on this right now, but at the moment, there is no way to get that. So therefore, any of the places that you need a green passport to go to, including hotels and various restaurants, et cetera, uh, you do not have the ability to get there. Again, hopefully that will change soon, but it's just important for you to know before you come, because a lot of people write to me after they're here and they say, when can, how can I get my green passport? And the answer is, you can't at this point. Hopefully that will change, but right now there's no mechanism for it. Okay, and just to get back to the grandparents, if somebody can't travel alone, for whatever reason, it doesn't have to be a grandparent, somebody who's incapacitated in some way, let's say in a wheelchair, whatever it is, they have the first degree relative. Can they bring someone along with them, an aide or a caregiver to help them through the, the plane ride? Sadly, at the moment, it's not allowed. Uh, it's not allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, I have heard people who are in the situation and what they've done is 
they've gone to try to find, uh, and I know this is not a, a solution for most situations, mm -hmm. but if they find somebody who has an Israeli passport, Israeli, and wants to be paid for a certain period of time to help, some people are exploring that because people who are Israeli obviously could come into Israel without the need for the approval. So that could be done. But again, the aid that this person is used to and the like, at this point, there's no mechanism to be able to travel with that person, sadly. Uh -huh. Unless they're a relative or whatever. Okay, whatever right. that is. Okay. Um, okay, the uh, apostille you already dealt with, we have that because that just changed. Um, okay, can, does everybody who applied together have to travel together? You know, you said like, let's say the parents are coming in to visit their daughter. Um, do they have to be on the same flight? Is this not, like question. how they, the people who apply together have to come together or not? Great question. They do not have to uh, fly together. Uh, the only time that could be different is if someone is coming in with your approval, meaning uh, I'm coming into Israel to visit my sister. As a result, I'm allowed to bring my wife and a child because right. the wife and the child are coming. First of all, they have to get their approvals, but they're coming because I'm traveling. Uh, therefore, they would have to travel together. But let's say there's a family that's uh -huh. coming in uh, for a wedding and there are parents who are vaccinated and siblings who are vaccinated. Uh, they, they do not have to travel uh, together. Okay, so that, that's an important thing that a few people asked about. Okay, here we go. Um, by the way, everybody, their, their chat and the Q&A are off intentionally. Normally during our webinars, we have those on, but we had so many questions that came in before that we just couldn't also open it up. So uh, hopefully, you know, you guys are taking notes. Hopefully we're answering whatever it is that you want answered. And as Rabbi Littman said, you can certainly be in touch with him afterwards if you need some um, something more to be clarified. Um, all right, so we talked about, uh, all right, well, one more question about fully vaccinated. Can someone come for business? You know, we talked about coming to visit relatives and not telling them you have a wedding, but going to the wedding while you're here. But there are other reasons that people are coming. There's a lot of people who do business back and forth, travel back and forth for very important reasons. Is, is that something that's it's able to be done now? At the moment, for business purposes, you have to fill out a form on the economy ministry uh, uh, a site. If someone sends me a message, I'll send you the link to fill it out. Right. They're only making allowances in situations. And again, this is very, very wide ranged phrase. Uh, business meetings that are essential for Israel. Uh, exactly what that means, exactly how that's proven. That's a process you'll have to go through with the economy ministry. But there is not a situation where just because, oh, I happen to have a business meeting and I'm vaccinated, I can pop in. Again, hopefully by July that will change and anyone who's vaccinated will be able to fly without the need to give the justification. But right, right now it's a very specific niche within the economy ministry where they have people who are assessing how essential this is for the Israeli side of the business venture. So if you have a billion dollar check and you're going to buy out one of Israel's high tech companies, your chances might be decent to get in right now. Very high, very high. Okay, if that applies to you guys, fabulous. Okay, now um, let's move on to people who aren't vaccinated. Okay, uh, hopefully you made it clear to a lot of people the hoops you have to jump through if you were sick or vaccinated, but in some way have antibodies and uh, God willing are not going to get sick or get other people sick. But how about people who for whatever reason did not get vaccinated either because they're too young, it's not available for children, or they have health issues that with it go against, you know, for whatever reason, um, getting the vaccine, ideological reasons, whatever it is, we all know people who, ha who haven't been vaccinated. Is there any way that they can travel to Israel? Okay, so here is where it gets uh, not complicated, but everybody has to bear with me here. Maybe we'll break it down into a few. Up until hours. now, it's been all really understandable. <laughs> okay, right, good. Right. Now it gets complicated. <laughs> Uh, the first category of someone who's not vaccinated or hasn't recovered from Corona that's allowed to come into Israel is for the wedding of a child. So parents who are living in countries or for whatever reason, they have not been vaccinated. If their child is getting married in Israel, they okay. are allowed to come to Israel, even though they have not been vaccinated for the wedding oh. of the child. Now, in order to do that, again, it's a very similar process of reaching out to the consulate or someone on the Israeli side going to the immigration authority office. Uh, they need to provide all the documentation 
that we talked about before. Let's just go over it again. It's the uh, for the passport or ID number of the person you're coming to see. In this case, it's the person who's in Israel getting married. Uh, it's the person who's applying. It's the proof of the family connection. Uh, it's the valid plane ticket. It's the health insurance. It's the isolation affidavit. And now we add one more point, which is the proof of the wedding taking place. Uh, the best thing for that is absolutely the wedding file at the chief rabbinate. Uh, so you, when people get married here, they have a wedding file with the chief rabbinate. That is something which could prove it. Uh, there is an option of a joint affidavit signed by the bride and the groom, signed by a notary, proof of the wedding taking place. That's essentially uh, what is required. That's the additional component. Now, remember, because they're not vaccinated right. or not recovered from corona, quarantine rules come into play. Mm -hmm. So when they come to Israel, aside from the corona test before, the corona test when they land, there's also two weeks of quarantine. Right. They would be allowed again to get out of quarantine if they get two negative tests during that period of time as well. So that's one situation where it's allowed for non-vaccinated parents to attend the wedding of their child. That's one. Okay. Okay. So if, if you're vaccinated and a grandparent, don't tell anybody you're coming for a wedding. But if you're not vaccinated and the parent, then that's how is how you get in is by saying you're coming for the wedding. Correct. So okay. Let me clarify. If you're a grandparent yeah. coming for a wedding and you're the only way you can get in is with a first degree relative, you're coming to don't visit let. your child uh, right. who's living in Israel and or, or your brother or sister living in Israel. However, right. you are related to someone in Israel and you do not mention the wedding. If you are not vaccinated and you're a parent coming for the wedding, you specifically have to mention the wedding. And that's where the, mm -hmm. the wedding is a part of the application process. And that's the only life cycle event that someone can come in for? A birth, uh, you know, a, a bar mitzvah, something, someone who, Lo Alenu, is on their deathbed. I mean, this is something that has come up in the past year where people on both sides, leaving Israel, coming to Israel, whatever it is all around the world, weren't with a loved one when they passed away. How great, does that fall in here? Great questions. Um, in terms of bar mitzvah and births, at the moment, non-vaccinated are not allowed to come in okay. uh, for that. Uh, okay. In terms of medical emergencies and funerals, uh, once you mentioned it, let's just talk about it for a moment. Certainly, uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can. There's an organization called Amudim. Uh, you can go on their website, and they have the ability to help in a medical emergency mm -hmm. and in a situation of a funeral. Uh, there is a process, of course, that Israel allows uh, for people to come in those situations. Uh, very strict rules regarding how it works. For example, for right. a funeral, uh, you are allowed to come in and actually go to the funeral. Uh, mm -hmm. but of course, uh, either one of two things, either then you go into quarantine or you turn around immediately within 24 hours and go back to your place of origin. So uh -huh. those are things which you'll be told, but there absolutely is a mechanism in both of those situations. Uh, obviously we have the humanitarian side. We wanna make sure people can come, but remember there's no special committee. Like there used to be a link for that, et cetera. Right. Uh, we have to just go directly to the source and arrange mm -hmm. for that to happen. You can reach out to me, you can reach out to Amudim and everyone will make sure that you're helped in that process. And how about somebody who passes away outside of Israel? And once, you know, they're bringing in the, the person, the body on the plane with them, that's that same rule applies, or it's not just somebody who dies in Israel and you want to come in, you, that whole thing can be arranged be, as well for the close yeah. family members. Yes, absolutely. They can arrange uh, for that to happen. Again, we're talking about also getting, uh, working on getting Corona tests, et cetera. It's, it's complicated right. given the current situation, but yes, right. uh, there is an allowance made uh, in those situations. And there's not a question in that case of vaccinated or, or not vaccinated. Okay, uh, understood. Now, I'm glad to hear that. Yes. Now, aside from the weddings, remember that was category one was parents mm -hmm. going to wedding. Category number two of unvaccinated who are allowed in are uh, parents and siblings of lone soldiers or oh. lone benot sherut. This is really important. I think this is Israel uh, making a statement of recognition, of thanks. Yes for parents who have their children have left home and they're coming and serving here, they mm -hmm. understand the emotional desire to spend time together. So right. again, certainly vaccinated, 
parents and siblings uh, of lone soldiers can come in. That's you know the mm-hmm. first degree relative relationship. They can absolutely do that. But also, and by the way, even if the lone soldier is just serving here as a lone soldier, not necessarily as a citizen, it's allowed. Right. But even right. non-vaccinated okay. parents and siblings can come to see their lone soldier or benot sherut child. They need all the things that we listed before, which I won't go through again. And in addition to all the things we mentioned, all the proofs of relationships and everything else and all the passports and the insurance and the isolation, and everything else, a photocopy of the IDF service card uh, or approval of a lone soldier signed by authorities, approval of Sherut Limwi organization for the volunteer. There has to be an official declaration that this person is a soldier or is a, uh, a, a Bat Sherut volunteer. So that's something which has to be added to that form. And again, all the other rules will apply in that case. The rules right. of the corona test beforehand, the rules of only two weeks before the flight, the rules of going into quarantine when you come to Israel. And in this case, if you're not vaccinated, you're in quarantine for two weeks or 10 days. That's just part right. of the deal. So Israel wants to make that allowance, but it also has to make sure uh, that uh, everything is in place in terms of protecting Israel from those who are not vaccinated. So that's a second category of not vaccinated uh, who are allowed into Israel. Any questions about that, Ian? No, I mean, is there any other category of someone who's not vaccinated who could come in? One more category, but it's actually a little bit, of, there's a few different categories here. This Within is, that category, okay. I'm sorry? There's subcategories within there's there. Okay. category with subcategories. So here we go. Okay. Non-Israelis who are not vaccinated or recovered from Corona can enter Israel if, number one, they're married to an Israeli citizen or a permanent resident, okay? They're married to an Israeli citizen. The marriage could have been done outside of Israel, but it has to be registered in Israel. So we're talking about Uh an Israeli married to a non-Israeli. The non-Israeli is allowed to come to Israel, even if not vaccinated, but it has to be a marriage that's registered in Israel. That's category number one. By the way, in that case, the proof of marriage would also have to have the apostille. In other words, when we're proving when the entire basis for coming is because of that, then it would have to have the apostille. Number two, uh, minor children of an Israeli citizen or a permanent resident. You have situations where for whatever reason, based on separation agreements, you have minor children who live overseas. They are allowed to come to visit their parent who's an Israeli citizen or a permanent resident, even if they're not vaccinated. Uh, okay. If someone is getting married to an Israeli citizen or a permanent resident, you are allowed to come into Israel even if they're not vaccinated for your marriage. Own wedding. <laughs> number four, you're a parent of an Israeli minor. In other words, your child is living in Israel and you're a parent of that minor. You have a custody agreement which allows you to spend time with your child. Those are the four that are allowed to uh, come in. Now, again, in all of these cases, you have all the documentation that you needed. So let me just go over it again because I said it pretty quickly. So make sure everybody knows. We're talking about people who are not vaccinated, married to an Israeli citizen or a permanent resident where the marriage is registered in Israel, minor children of an Israeli citizen or a permanent resident. Number three, getting married to an Israeli citizen or a permanent resident. Number four, they're a parent of an Israeli minor who is living in Israel. There's a custody agreement. Those are the cases. In all of these situations, you have to provide all the documentation. So again, for a bride or groom situation, it's the rabbinate wedding file. For a parent visiting a minor child, you have to have the custody agreement uh, to show uh, all these situations. We have to be able to show the situation to prove the relationship and why you're coming in these cases. Okay. Um, Excuse me. We've been talking about non-Israelis. How about Israelis? What are the rules for like, you know, an Israeli, I got a letter today from someone in South Africa. He was there on business, wants to come home. Any problem? So let's put aside South Africa for a moment because we have to see exactly where it falls into the categories. That's that's one of the, yeah, yeah. But but assuming that we're talking about a country which is not in the uh, difficult uh, areas as we've talked about, uh, in that situation, an Israeli is allowed to just get a ticket uh, they do. Remember, there's two things, though. They have to get the corona test uh, beforehand. Uh, they, if they are vaccinated, right, they, they certainly could provide that documentation, and that will have impact on their situation with quarantine. But again, right. they also have to go to quarantine. 
serological test to get out of the quarantine. Mm -hmm. That's what they have to do. If they have not been vaccinated, then they have to go into the full two week or possibly 10 day quarantine. So they do have the allowance though to travel as long as they have a valid Israeli passport. I do wanna mention, uh, I talked about before about a spouse of an Israeli resident or, or Israelis who wanna come back. Uh, what about their children? Uh, right. This is very interesting because a lot of people, a lot of Israelis have children who they're living overseas and their children have not been registered as Israelis. Um, mm. Israel is requiring at this point, and this, by the way, is a source of a lot of contention. They are not allowing Israelis to travel back to Israel if their children have not been registered as Israelis, which is a mm. lengthy process, apparently, in the consulate, which is really holding people back. For being right. able to travel, but that is the policy at the moment. So you'll you'll make your application to the consulate, and then they'll say you have to come and register your child as an Israeli. And obviously, the parents have to decide whether or not they want to move forward with that uh, or not. That's that's definitely an issue. We're working on trying to see if there's a way for that to be moved a little bit or changed. But at the moment, that is the absolute policy in that case as well. Mm -hmm. And Israelis who want to leave the country, that's not a problem either at the moment. They just have to go with whatever requirements are for the country that they're going to. Correct. And by the way, uh, in many situations, that is what people are doing for the family reunification. People miss each yes. other a lot. They haven't seen each other. So in many situations, it's just the Israeli couple or pa family picking up and traveling because Israelis, whether they are vaccinated or not, are allowed to travel overseas. Again, we have this new directive about certain countries where that might not be allowed, and we'll certainly right. post about that and make that clear. But for the most part, uh, it is allowed. But again, when they come back, then you have the issue of the rules of quarantine, because those mm -hmm. who are vaccinated in Israel do not have to go into quarantine. Right. But if you've traveled with your children, uh, then you have the issue of children having to go into quarantine because they are not vaccinated. Which essentially means you're with them because you're not leaving your five-year-old at home by himself. So Presumably. I hope. <laughs> Presumably that's that could be another webinar. All right. So there's there's another topic that I know has caused people a lot of anxiety, and that's the issue of the 72 hours. Okay, that you have to have get the PCR um, 72 hours before you get on your flight. Now, is that 72 hours before you land in Israel? Is that 72 hours before your flight takes off? What if your flight is delayed, which has been happening not, you know, not uh, rarely these days? When does that 72 hours start to kick in? It is 72 hours before you take off. Uh, that's the rule. Uh, but this is really important because you asked it. Uh, if the flight is delayed and as a result, it goes beyond the 72 hours, you still need to find a test. Uh, you have to get a test. There are airports which do have the ability, apparently, to get tests. I know that JFK uh, does have that. It, 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 it's expensive and it's hard for people, and, and that's really, really a hard thing. But, but I've checked and verified with the health ministry. Uh, they absolutely need to be within 72 hours of the flight, even if the flight is delayed and it's no fault of your own. You do have right. to find a, a solution <clears throat> to that problem. And again, that is for every single person who is traveling all across the board. Vaccinated or other, unvaccinated. Right. Correct. There are other documents as well uh, that people need. Uh, there's a declaration form uh, that has to be made before uh, the flight. Uh, I do know, I do know that there's been an issue with the health ministry form as of late. There's been a technical problem. And therefore, if you do try to fill out the health ministry form and you are not successful, you can go to your flight anyway. The airlines have all been notified that there's a technical problem. And therefore, until you hear otherwise, if you were not able to fill out that health ministry form, you can go and say, I tried, it didn't work. And they are supposed to allow you onto the flight. Hmm. If they don't, reach out to me, <laughs> reach out to me. Uh, we do have a mechanism to deal with that when it happens. Uh, in fact, I mentioned to Eve that uh, as we speak, uh, there's a, an emergency situation that I've been dealing with. They have not called me during the webinar, and therefore I have not had to ask to go for a moment. Right. Uh, but we are on call, available uh, to help people in this situation. It's just the airlines having to be notified officially, and we make sure that that happens. But people get very panicked by that because you're told you have to have the corona test. You have to have this health form from right. the health ministry doesn't work at this point in time. It's a technical glitch on the Israeli side, and therefore you are allowed to still fly without it. Take advantage of the glitch. Okay, sounds good. Um, do you have to print it out or this is all online? That form, if you manage to fill it out. 
Yeah, the ideal would be to print it out. They are accepting it in most cases if you show it on your phone, but all of these forms that you're supposed to have beforehand, the proof of the COVID test, anything else, it is best to absolutely have it uh, with you. By the way, okay. I've also been suggesting to people to carry all of their paperwork with them. You know, for whatever reason, there's any kind of a question mark that's provided, have that PDF file, certainly have the approval in hand, have everything that you need, because you just never know if there's gonna be any questions for right. any reason, there's no reason not to be uh, fully prepared for that. Right, and I think people should also know that flying these days, you're flying with a mask on all the time, and the, the airlines are being very, very strict about that, even while you're sleeping, except for when you're eating. Um, so, you know, it's a long flight and keep that in mind that, uh, that's something that you're, you're going to have to do. And, and they're, they really are keeping an eye on that. Um, anything else that you can think of that I didn't ask you? I'm sure there is aside from you have to leave a kidney while you're here also, which is the one thing we didn't discuss. <laughs> it seems um, like that's about the only thing you don't have to do. Right. Um, uh, children under one year old is a question, which hmm. I get, uh, quite often, uh, children under one year old do have to have the Corona test and they do fit into all the rules as well in terms of uh, the, the, you know, the, the quarantine and, and the like, it's all, it's all the same, meaning there's no mm -hmm. children under one year old. Uh, absolutely. Uh, if they're traveling, uh, they do have to have the Corona test. Even though like they're saying that nursing moms are, who got vaccinated are passing the antibodies onto their babies. It's not, I happen to know this just from my own grand, my five month old grandson, that they, he's being nursed and she had the vaccine and where presumably he's covered, but it's not showing up in the serology test because apparently it doesn't, but that doesn't matter. Nursing babies right. don't get a pass. I'm looking at it right now, just to double check. Nursing yeah, babies are vaccinated moms. Right. And I want everybody to <laughs> or know recovered. That Right. I want everybody to know that, you know, I wanted to make sure that all the answers were correct. And I was in touch with all the ministry officials beforehand. So the question, because there was a lot of misinformation about the under one year olds, so I specifically asked uh, the question. Uh, they do absolutely have to uh, have be dude, the, the quarantine, and they do need the Corona test uh, before the flights as well, even if they're under one years old. Uh -huh. Okay. And I just want to thank you for those of us who think that we don't have a government in Israel. I don't know why we would think that, that you seem to be in touch with just about every official who is actually there and doing what it is that they're supposed to be doing and how much we appreciate that. Um, and, uh, and really giving, you know, giving this advice to everybody and keeping on top of things. Um, Eve, I do want to correct I one thing also, which I just want to make sure I might've answered incorrectly before. I want to make sure it's clear. You were okay. asking about having to travel together and uh, I have it very clear Approved from families. as well. Right. I'm sorry, that even if you're traveling because of uh, somebody else, uh, you do not have to fly on the same flight. I think I mentioned before that if, you, if you're traveling because of someone else, perhaps you have to be on the same flight, you do not. So in other words, if let's say I'm allowed to go to Israel because my spouse is allowed or my parent is allowed, I do not have to be on the same flight with them to go to Israel. We have you get your approval and you do not have to be on the same flight. Just wanted to clarify that. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. That 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 sounds good. Um, thank you. Uh, can you think of anything else that uh, that's come up? I'm sure you've had a million different scenarios across your yeah, desk. I, I can't at the moment. Uh, I, I do want to, again, uh, encourage everyone to do two things. Number one, uh, actually three things. <laughs> Number one, uh, take a deep breath. Uh, it's, it's a hard time and it's very, very anxious because people don't have clarity about it. Uh, right. Getting panicked and getting anxious and, and doesn't help. Uh, there are people available to guide you through it. Uh, first of all, like I said before, I am available via Facebook. Uh, you can just like my Facebook page and send a message to me and I'll absolutely answer that. I do want to mention again that I do have uh, someone on the United States side right. who is also helping, uh, Maureen Ash, ashmaureen at gmail.com. My email address, by the way, is ddlipman at gmail.com. You can That's one P in Lipman, by the way, everybody. I'm sorry. One P, one P in Lipman. One P, D-D-L-I-P-M-A-N mm -hmm. at gmail. Uh, Facebook Messenger is actually easier for me, but email is certainly fine. Uh, those are two, number one. Number two, uh, do understand the situation that Israel's in and, and understand that it's not coming from a place of not exactly. wanting visitors to come. Uh, I'm in regular touch with the health minister who is sweet, nice, 
caring. Uh, Yuli Edelstein from the Likud, he, he wants yes. his, uh, the families of Olim to come. He wants to help, but he's also responsible for the health situation in Israel. And there's this constant uh, tug of war, I would call it, where how far do you go? The fact right. that in July, they are talking about anybody who's vaccinated being able to come. That's a major, major step for a country to yes. say, we'll open up our doors. And we certainly hope that everything goes smoothly until then and that it happens. And then finally, the last point which I want to make, Eve, which I, it's also very uh, important. You know, first of all, I thank the One Israel Fund for uh, hosting uh, and all the work that you do. Uh, let's all zoom out for one moment. And, and really think about what our challenges are. And I am not for a moment belittling the pain that families feel about being separated from one another. I am not belittling the pain. I made a wedding, my sisters were not here. I cried under the chuppah when I spoke because of it. I understand, I really, really do. And I don't mean to diminish it at all. But I also zoom out and I tell myself, these are our challenges. Our challenges are, how to navigate a system to be able to visit our relatives or visit Eretz Israel, the state of Israel, a Jewish state in the 21st century. And whenever I get frustrated and whenever I feel pain, whenever I hear people crying to me on the phone, which is an almost daily occurrence, when I finish that call, I just zoom out for a moment and I remind myself, our challenge is not the czars, our challenge is not pogroms, our challenge is not that we're living in an impossible situation where we can't defend ourselves, but rather our challenge is how do we navigate a really tough situation in a time when prophecies are coming true before our eyes with the reflourishing of the land of Israel right. and the ingathering of the exiles. And all I ask everyone is with all the difficulties and the challenges, and we're here to help you through it, just also remember that and remember that we say, Gam ze ya'avur. With God's help, we will get to a time where Israel's doors will be open, where the whole mm -hmm. world will be past this, and we'll get back to life as normal. And when we do, let's make sure we also appreciate that life is not normal, that we have the land of Israel <laughs> and the state of Israel, and really appreciate the times in which we live. And hopefully that recognition can give us the strength and the wherewithal to get through this incredibly challenging time. All right. I would like to add to that also, as Israelis, how much we appreciate living in a country that has done, as we say in Hebrew, me alo me more than virtually any other country in making sure that vaccines were available, available for free. All right. To anybody who was an Israeli citizen and foreign workers and just about anybody who was here, Student, the gap year kids. Well. The gap year kids all got vaccinated. A lot of the people working here, not something to be taken for granted that comes out of the taxes that we pay, and it's but it's something that I really think shows the uh, the importance that this Jewish state puts on human life, on the value of human life, and on and on being well as much as we possibly can. And yes, there's questions about the vaccine, and there's there's all these different issues that keep us chattering for and will for a long time. And hopefully, everybody will be fine. But uh, it's really incredible uh, to see the tremendous effort that went here. Um, that people should do it and to understand. And I've gotten some mail from people because since it's a Jewish country, everybody feels like it's theirs, even if they're not living in Israel. And I've gotten mail from people saying, but I'm a Jew, I have the right to come to Israel whenever I want. And it's a little more complicated than that because Israel is a modern, yes, absolutely, but Israel is a modern state that has a healthcare system that almost collapsed a couple of months ago because of the burden that it was under. And uh, and there, again, as you said, there has to be that balance between keeping the citizens safe, doing family reuni reunification, making sure that people can see their loved ones, hopefully in good times and in life cycle events and, and not just bad, um, but also making sure that you know we stay safe and that the people here follow the who do come here to visit. And as you said, tremendous efforts are going into that follow the rules so that maybe just innocently or maybe not so innocently, we don't start with another wave here because the situation is still very tenuous and we really don't know. There's and still I, so I, much that we don't know. Absolutely. And I do want to mention, uh, it's my honor to be the one that's presenting here now, but there have been so many who have been very involved in advocating for all yeah. of you. And that's what I really want to emphasize. Aside from myself, a uh, former member of Knesset now, Michal Cutler-Wunsch, spent months fighting yes. for everyone. 
uh, the people at Nefesh for Nefesh, the people at Amudim, there's an organization of Chaim Bechesed. Uh, right. Many, many people are out there, and I don't want anyone to think that there's any one individual uh, that's able to navigate this, but just know that all the people I just mentioned and others, and including myself, are continuing to advocate um, mm -hmm. We do believe that there should be some changes to the rules. We are always there mentioning the problems and the flaws that are there. And, and hopefully, aside from all the things that I mentioned in terms of what will open up, there might be some other changes here and there as well. And that's why I certainly look out for the updates and, and know that your voice is being heard. When you uh, reach out and you mention the difficulties and the challenges, uh, we are hearing it on the Israeli side and their yes, organizations absolutely. as well. And we're all doing the mo most that we can uh, to help with a very challenging situation as well. Yeah. And Michal Kotler Wunsch, we were honored to have on a webinar a few months ago, and she was really, really awesome. And um, I'm going to say this as an Ola, as someone who made Aliyah a long time ago already, but from an English speaking country, I'm really, really proud of both of you and of her, because when we talk about the people in politics and that there aren't enough people from the Western world who may go getting involved in Israeli politics. And it's understandable also, it's a difficult arena to play in, shall we? And you're smiling and yes. Um, but I think it really, I, I think you should get a tremendous amount of thanks for being public servants in the sense of what that means, of not going in for your own honor and not going in for whatever it is, but going in because there is an audience that you represent, there's a group of people that you represent, and that's what public servants are supposed to be doing, is making sure that in any way they can, things are made easier. And especially for those of us who, you know, those people living in Israel, where it may not be as uh, knowledgeable in Hebrew and in finding their way around all the paperwork, it is, what you're doing now is really very critical and very, very much appreciated. And I'm gonna, I'm channeling all the hand clapping from all the people in front of their computers. Um, I don't know if all the questions were answered. I mean, I do know that they probably weren't all answered because they're very, very specific questions. But I think that in the last hour and a quarter, you definitely made some, you know, gave some clarity and hopefully there are some people who now have a better understanding. Once again, the disclaimer, whatever you said is true up until right now, you still need to be in touch with your consulates. You still need to be in touch with the immigration offices here if that's the way you're going to go. And things are changing all the time. It's really a dynamic situation for the good and for the bad. And so um, I hope to see you all here soon. I hope that you come uh, to Israel, you get to the Kotel, you get to your families, you get on one of my buses, which will start running at some point. It's too early yet. Um, and we have not been sitting on our hands here in Israel. I know that's why a lot of you want to come. We've been busy. We've been building. We've been growing. We've been having babies. It's an awesome country. It's only gotten more awesome in the last year with all the craziness that you hear on the news. And um, really, I wish you all Godspeed in, in getting here. There's really no other way of saying it. And Rabbi Dov Lippman, I want to thank you so much. This webinar will be available within the next 24 hours on the One Israel Fund site. If you are on our mailing list, you will also get it sent to you. You may pass it around. You may do whatever you want with it um, to get the information out. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And I hope that you learned something. I most certainly did. And of course, if you need to be in touch with Rabbi Littman, uh, he has, for reasons that I can't figure out, made himself like totally available. As I said to him before, did you do something awful in a previous life that this is what you're doing now? I don't even wanna know, but really so much appreciate uh, what you're doing. And, uh, and hopefully you won't have to do it for very much longer. This law gets settled and you can go back to writing your books and all the wonderful other things that you do in your spare time. Okay, thank so thank you people. very much. That, that's Everyone. certainly the hope. That's certainly the hope. But we'll always be here, available to advocate for whatever people need uh, in Israel. And hopefully, you know, Corona will pass. But you'll always have people available to uh, help you. And again, that's please huge. follow on Facebook all the updates. I'll have all the information there. Fantastic. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much. What thanks again to One Israel Fund for sponsoring this event. And if you want to get involved, please be in touch. There's so much you can do even from far away. And then you can come and you can see the park that you donated because we'll have it up already by the time you get here. And that is an awesome feeling. Eve Harrow, Director of Tourism and Community Development for One Israel Fund. Really honored to have been with you tonight. We'll be back in a few weeks with another webinar and a couple of weeks with another virtual tour. So please stay tuned with everything we're doing. And most importantly, everybody be well. Really be well, be safe, and take care. Thanks so much, Dove. Bye. Thank you.